Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Waterloo, The Truth Behind Napoleon's Final Defeat by History March. So, I recently finished Epic History TV's Napoleonic War series, though I still have Napoleon's Marshals to watch, which I will do. Um, and their video on Waterloo was made a little bit before the rest of the videos and was sort of of a different standard. And so after watching that one, a lot of you recommended I come watch this video by History March to sort of get more information uh, on what actually happened at Waterloo. And so that's what I'm doing now. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. Late May, 1815. Exiled to Elba in 1814, mm. Napoleon had returned in March and is once again Emperor of the French. Europe, committed to restoring the old order, has declared war on Napoleon. They plan to invade France and restore the monarchy. The Russian and Austrian armies are approaching from the east. The Anglo-Dutch army under Wellington is headquartered in Brussels. The Prussian army under Blücher is headquartered in Namur. Napoleon is vastly outnumbered. All right. The truth behind Napoleon's Before final defeat. Continue, I want to give a shout out to Curiosity Street. A subscription streaming service built exclusively for documentaries. It was created by the same guy who founded the Discovery Channel. You can watch. All right, you know the deal. Go check out History March. Uh, the link to their video is down below, uh, and go check out uh, their sponsor. Show them some love. All that good stuff. There's their link. History March. When you sign up. My favorite category on Curiosity Stream is, of course, history. There is a wealth of videos about prehistoric, ancient, medieval times, modern warfare, aviation, and others. But they don't just offer history, their content also spans science. Nate, enter the. Alright, very good stuff. So go check out their video and check out their sponsor. History Marsh, when you sign up, to get 30 days completely free. King Louis XVIII has fled France and set up court in Ghent, 60 kilometers west of Brussels. From Ghent, the king's agents and spies have infiltrated Napoleon's government and... Huh. Yeah, that is another factor that I didn't even think about in the <coughs> other video on Waterloo, which is that, you know, we have the king back. We have Louis XVIII. Um, I don't think that was mentioned or at least covered that much in the other video on Waterloo. Um, so that's another factor to this. You know, France has an alternative uh, leader. It has a member of the monarchy back in power, um, which of course, you know, <coughs> the first time that the coalition defeated Napoleon, we had Napoleon as the uh, unquestioned emperor versus them. But I totally forgot that uh, the French royal family would be a part of this, that they would be back in action. That's got to add uh, some some elements to this and so per perhaps some threats to Napoleon within France. Some extra threats. The army. The role of Fouché is well known. Plotting Napoleon's downfall from the moment he returned to France. Mm. However, there were many others. The king also has spies and agents in the French army, many in direct communication with Ghent, providing intelligence. Okay, so that, that that's really interesting. That's something that I did not think of. Um, that has definitely got to be uh, a big challenge to Napoleon to have spies, so many spies within his ranks, because it's not like we're dealing with foreign spies we are dealing with French spies loyal to the French monarch. Um, so <laughs> I imagine that was quite um, a benefit to the coalition, having all these spies um, and men in fairly important positions 
who were willing to uh, operate behind the scenes and give them information on Napoleon. Along the frontier, the king has stationed officers to collect deserters and sow discord. Hmm. One such officer was the Marquis de Castries, a former aide-de-camp of Davu, now stationed in Namur, whose staff included a former curacier, Friedrich Rie. Napoleon faced a severe shortage of horses, and the financial situation was perilous. Hmm. An insurrection was raging in the Vendée, requiring... Wow. Okay. So that I'm glad we're getting a lot of this information on the French side of things because there's a lot going on. Um, apparently, we've got an insurrection in the Vendée, and if you're unaware, the Vendée was the site of um, the most prominent royalist slash Catholic insurrection during the original French Revolution in the early 1790s. Um, I mean, there were rebellions. Uh, anti-revolutionary rebellions throughout France, but the Vendée had the most prominent and biggest rebellion, which was crushed by the French uh, revolutionary forces. So it's interesting to see um, another counter-revolutionary force ari arise in the Vendée. Um, you know, I would not have thought about that, just like I wouldn't have thought about the king and his spies, but upon hearing it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm glad that we're getting some of this, uh, this domestic drama that Napoleon is dealing with. Requiring troops to be dispatched to the interior. Mm. Once the Allies invaded, his military situation would arguably be better than in 1814. But his political situation was unstable. Right. He needed an event to rally the country around him before the Allied invasion. And, and that makes a lot of sense because upon Napoleon's first surrender it was his... Uh, officer corps that basically told him like look it's over and so now you know he's returned his position cannot be too secure you know a return from exile after uh you know more than a decade of warfare um i, I can imagine that his political position will be pretty shaky particularly you've just had the reestablishment of the monarchy uh, i'm sure a lot of people we're not super happy with that, but as I said, that is does give sort of an alternative to Napoleon. Um, uh, and I know, as we've talked about, some people were thrilled upon his return, but you can imagine that a lot of the French population might just want peace, um, because that was the case in 1814. A lot of the civilians in France, you know, they weren't, you know, too interested in supporting or opposing Napoleon. They just wanted peace after so much warfare. And while, you know, you can imagine there'd be somewhat of a patriotic upsurge upon Napoleon's return, you can also imagine people feeling like, are we really going back to war again? I thought we were done with this. Brussels was the answer. A lightning stroke to seize the Belgian capital and possibly return Belgium to France would captivate the nation. True. The traitors would be shaken from the army. And that is true. Um, you know, expanding French borders, expanding French borders to their natural frontiers, which we talked about uh, in other videos on Napoleon, was uh, a very popular thing among the populace. It's one of those patriotic goals that most people could agree on. So regardless of, you know, your political inclination, if you're a revolutionary, a royalist, a supporter of Napoleon, or wherever you are, you would probably be, if you're French, pretty happy about the reclamation of Belgium. That would be a, a big patriotic victory. Um, so... You know, I'm not sure in the grand scheme how much it would help, but Napoleon was probably right that it would be very popular. And Napoleon would gain the political stability necessary to deal with those in government. Napoleon Perhaps. Decided to strike. On June 3rd, Napoleon ordered Marshal Soult, who was Napoleon's Major General, commander of the army headquarters, and responsible for distributing his orders, to bring Gerard's 4th Corps from Metz to Philippeville. Mm. Napoleon also reorganized the cavalry, taking divisions attached to the infantry corps and creating four cavalry corps, 
under the overall command of Marshal Grouchy. On June 4th, Sou gave a detailed report to Napoleon of the locations of the infantry corps of Army de Nord and the time required to reach the staging areas for an invasion. First corps at Maubeuge, two-day march, leaving on the 11th. Second corps to the right of Maubeuge on the Sambre, one-day march, leaving on the 12th. Third corps north of Philippeville, two-day march, leaving on the 12th. Fourth Corps at Philippeville, seven or eight day march, leaving on the 6th. Sixth Corps, previously indicated to be at Devan, five day march, leaving on the 9th. Imperial Guard at Devan, staggered march, arriving on the 13th. Everything was planned so the army would be in position by the evening of the 12th to be moved into final positions on the 13th and launched on the Sombre on June 14th, the anniversary of the victories of Morongo and Friedland. Yeah, I mean, if Napoleon is going to, you know, win this battle, he will need that level of organization and preparation so that he can act quickly and decisively. Um, you know, he's outnumbered. Um, he needs to, well, he needs to pull off a classic Napoleon victory. He needs to act quickly, decisively. And this sort of planning, I'm sure, would greatly uh, benefit that goal. Napoleon planned to come between the Anglo-Dutch and Prussian armies. The French army, vastly superior to either Allied army, would compel the Allies to retreat. Right. They could survive a battle on their own. Napoleon would occupy Brussels by June 16th. A thunderclap heard across Europe. The king would be chased from the continent and the traitors purged from his government and army. <laughs> On June 5th, Sue issued the orders to Girard. They had been adjusted to have the 4th Corps arrive in Rocroix by June 13th. The Emperor has ordered me to inform you that his plan is that you begin the Army de la Moselle's march upon receipt of this order, that is to say, 7th of June, and that you direct it following the itinerary attached to Rocroix, where it must be on the 13th of this month, without fail. On June 6th, Sue sent orders to the rest of the army. First Corps was ordered to be ready to march within three hours of receiving orders, Second Corps was ordered to concentrate near Maubeuge by June 13th. Mm. Third Corps was ordered to concentrate between Marienburg and Chimay by June 13th. Fourth Corps was already ordered to Rocroix by June 13th. Sixth Corps was ordered to Aven by June 13th. The Guard had already been ordered to Aven, and Grouchy's four reserve cavalry corps were also ordered into position. Napoleon had ordered the formation of two columns on the frontier and planned to use the day of June 13th to put the army into a final position. And I, I wonder how effectively all of those orders were carried out, given that we've got a pretty precise set of orders with some pretty tight limitations on time. You know, we want everything to be moving like clockwork. Um, so I wonder if the different... Uh, forces were able to effectively follow those orders to the T, because I'm sure that would be pretty important in a battle like this. He had positioned the army so that it could cross the Sambre at Maubeuge and fall on Mont, or it could cross at Chalois. Either location would put Napoleon on a major road to Brussels and place the French army between Wellington and Blücher. On June 7th, Napoleon ordered Sue to Lille to assure the security of the French frontier west of the planned advance. By June 11th, Sue was ordered to return to Lyon in order to meet Napoleon on June 12th. Mm. On June 10th, Napoleon finalized the concentration. With Sue absent, Bertrand, Grand Marshal of the Palace, would be responsible for the dictation and distribution of the orders. Two orders would be written that day. The first, position the army in a square south of Maubeuge, with a corner of the square pointing directly at Mont. The second order written, 
put the army in three balanced columns on roads to Charleroi. It is this second order that Bertrand distributed to the army generals. The plans for Mons existed only as a draft on Bertrand's notes and an original mm. sent to Sue. These orders were sent to Lon, where Sue was expected to arrive on June 11th. Did Napoleon change his mind? Or was the order to advance on more a carefully constructed ruse meant to fool the Allies? <laughs> Fouché claimed he had an agent steal the plans of the campaign. A claim that Sir Walter Scott confirmed during the occupation of Paris after Waterloo. However, Fouché was playing both sides, and he arranged for the interception of these plans at the border. If the Allies defeated Napoleon, Fouché would say he tried to steal the plans. Mm -hmm. But if Napoleon won, he would say he captured a spy. Yeah, I think it can be difficult to work out the truth in situations like this where we have quick regime change back and forth because you'll have men like Fouché or Talleyrand who are always willing to play both sides and look out for themselves um, first and foremost. And so you can never be quite sure what's true because, you know, they've always got something to tell you <laughs> if it goes one way well i was doing this if it goes another way actually i was trying to do this um that'll save their own ass so you know <laughs> i mean we got to analyze our sources of information and why exactly they're telling us what they're telling us and in a case like this it can be difficult to work out what exactly is true during june the allies repeatedly heard rumors of an attack on Mont. Is it possible Napoleon was giving the Allies and their agents in Paris false information in order to keep Wellington west of Charleroi? There are a couple of facts that support the Mons plan as a ruse. Mm. First, unlike the Charleroi plan, all of the positions given are imprecise. Second call is to the rear of Maubeuge. First call is near and to the rear. Third call is to the right, etc. This is unlike any order Napoleon sent in 1815. Hmm. And the Charleroi plan, the one actually sent to the generals, is absolutely precise, with a location for each formation's headquarters. Second, Grouchy had recently been given command of the newly organized Cavalry Corps and Fourth Corps, and had been recently ordered to join the Army de Nord. Napoleon could hope that the Allies were unaware of these events. And both are excluded from the Mons plan letter Bertrand addressed to Sue. On June 11th, Sue, for reasons unknown, remained at a van. He was not in law when Napoleon's orders arrived, and he would only receive them late in the day of June 12th in Uh oh. Considerable time was lost, as the courier must have waited in law for Sue's arrival until it was clear he was not coming. Sue initially began executing the orders for the advance on Charleroi, but then switched to the plan for more. Had two orderlies been sent to Law, but arrived in a van in reverse order, thus confusing Sue. Yeah, okay, I'm, uh, I'm seeing a bit of the uh, confusion that's taking place here. Um, and I think this reminds us that we always must take into account what other factors uh, can affect your plan. Or the fact that you can never predict what factors will emerge. And also human error or human variability, whatever you want to call it. Humans will sometimes make decisions that you did not expect or things will go wrong. Someone will get stuck somewhere. Salt won't be where he's supposed to be. Orders won't reach them in time. Um, and in, in a case like this where you've got a tightly planned operation, if you have uh, a change, a little tweak somewhere... Uh, that could change the, you know, course of the entire battle, potentially, you know? It could have a big effect. It may not, sometimes. I mean, things happen all the time. Problems happen and um, things remain the same. But occasionally, you can have a small issue that causes a massive ripple effect. Um, and so, you know, the confusion that we're seeing here um, makes me think of that. And also, of course, um, you know, this... The communication of the early 19th century, you know, we're in 1815, um, <coughs> you know, we're still uh, delivering everything through couriers. That's the best we can do. 
Uh, and there's obviously a lot of issues with that, and we'll see great developments in communication technology throughout the 19th century, but this is also a good look at sort of the issues with that system. Or had Sue received the intercepted false Mons orders after the Charleroi orders? Whatever the event, Sue had adopted the Mons plan, contrary to Napoleon's final wishes. Hmm. Napoleon left Paris on June 12th and arrived in Aven on June 13th. He immediately countermanded Sue's orders and ordered the army into the three columns for an advance on Charleroi. As Sue plainly said to Van Damme, according to the orders that I sent to you yesterday, you were to gather your army corps in Beaumont. But the Emperor has again ordered the execution of the Order of the Day from the 10th of which I sent you the appellation. According to which you were to gather your troops during the day of the 13th in front of Philippeville. It is thus the dispositions of the order given by the Emperor on the 10th that you must follow. Mm. The rest of the army was given similar orders. Due to the delays introduced by Sue not being in law and giving the wrong orders, Napoleon would delay the advance until June 15th. Van Damme would receive the orders too late and Napoleon would order him to remain in Beaumont. Thus, overloading the center column. Ah. Napoleon used June 14th to move the army closer to the frontier. Napoleon heard from his spies that the Allies had not moved on June 13th or June 14th. He had every reason to believe he had achieved his goal of concentrating his army on the Sombre without Wellington or Blücher knowing. At 11.30 p.m., Neissenau, the Prussian chief of staff, began the concentration of the Prussian army. French traitors had informed him of the impending attack. The 12 plus hours gained allowed the Prussians to field an army at Sombrev. As the great Prussian historian Leto Vorbeck states, without this treason committed by members of the French army, the surprise intended by Napoleon would have been successful to an even stronger degree than was the case now. Yeah, okay, so we're seeing a couple of things play into this. Um, we talked about, you know, the spies um, within the French forces earlier um, due to this situation of, uh, you know, split loyalties, loyalties to the emperor, loyalties to the king and the dynasty. Um, and so, you know, the coalition are being fed information from French spies. Uh, and then also we're seeing the effects of this confusion with the orders, um, <coughs> you know, it's sort of slowing everything down um, and, you know, giving the Allies more of a chance to move in and, you know, probably contributing to the French being perhaps less prepared than they would otherwise be if the plan had been uh, followed exactly as written. Of course, no plan is followed exactly as written, but... You know, we can kind of see the disruptions here. Though delayed and worried about the advance via Mons, the gathered Prussian army allowed Wellington to order the concentration of his army at Catropra without fears of immediate destruction. Napoleon's plan was to prevent Allied cooperation. But not only were Wellington and Blücher working together on June 16th, they literally were able to meet in person. Wow. Yeah, that is uh, exactly what Napoleon doesn't want. And this is the issue Napoleon's been facing for a while, which is together, the coalition forces greatly outnumber him. He needs to split them apart. Uh, and this battle uh, is a great example of that. You know, Napoleon does not want the Prussians and the Brits to be unified. He needs to fight them separately, and he really does not want them cooperating in any way, because that's very bad for him. Napoleon believed on June 16th he would push a single Prussian corps aside and force march that night with his guard to Brussels. But instead of facing no major battles, the French ended up fighting too. Mm. Ney and Wellington met at Quatre and fought to a stalemate, while Napoleon defeated Blücher at Ligny. However, on June 18th, the Allied armies were joined and would deal Napoleon a decisive defeat at Waterloo. Right. French traitors had destroyed Napoleon's plan, 
But the root of this destruction was the delay which allowed the king's agents in the French army to tip off the Prussians. Ha, huh, okay. If Napoleon kept to his original schedule, the French army would have crossed the Sambre and occupied the Nivelle Namur Road. So it really was that delay combined with French spies, um, French royalists, uh, that, according to History March, made the difference. Um, I'm not sure to what extent that's generally accepted historiography. Um, that's the argument being presented here. I'm not too familiar with the Napoleonic Wars, so I'm not sure if there were other perspectives on if there hadn't been a delay, if the plan really would have worked, uh, or if some people disagree with that. Um, but that, that's the argument being presented here. I'm just, you know, trying to stay aware that, you know, obviously... In every video we watch, there are certain narratives being presented, but this does provide a different perspective from the Epic History TV Waterloo video. Um, so it's good that we're getting <coughs> a different perspective on the situation, a different view on the situation. Um, and certainly very interesting and definitely um, sort of explains what happened. Wellington and Blücher would have had their communications greatly impacted and would not have been able to coordinate a defense. Napoleon would have occupied Brussels or had either army chosen to give battle, destroyed it. Mm. The delay was caused by Sioux remaining in Aven and the confusion caused by two orders. What was the purpose of the Mons order? Had Napoleon changed his mind or had a carefully constructed ruse gone horrifically bad. <laughs> On June 22nd, 1815, Napoleon signed his abdication. It is believed that this took place in the Salon d'Argent in the Palais d'Elysée, Napoleon's mm. residence during the 100 days. The Salon d'Argent is in the rear of the palace, on its eastern side. If he signed his abdication here, it is possible the Salon d'Argent served as his office during 1815. Adjacent to the office is a staircase. Napoleon would be exiled to St. Helena, joined by his faithful companion, Bertrand. <laughs> In 1821, after Napoleon's death, Bertrand returned to Europe, arriving in Portsmouth on August 1st. On August 6th, Bertrand and his family travelled to London, where they took resident at Brunette's Hotel of Leicester Square, along with Montholon and his family. Mm. During their stay in England, Bertrand and Montholon were often visited by various officers and government officials. On September 15th, John Cam Hophouse visited Bertrand, and he recounted his visit in his diary. I called with D. Kinnaird on Count Bertrand. Very interested to see why we're getting this uh, extra info on Bertrand. Um, seems like a bit of a tangent, but uh, uh, I'm curious to see what information we're getting here. At Brunette's hotel. Found him and his countess, his brother, and another person there. The countess, ill with a cough. A pale, tall, thin, agreeable-looking woman of a certain age. The count, <laughs> very solicitous about her health. Okay. Bertrand drew near to me and spoke frankly about my book. Said the Emperor saw at once that il sautait de la classe, that he saw I had a recourse to good informants, that he at first had resolved to answer the book and to correct many points of which he alone has knowledge, having the reins of government and could give a just account, that he observed I had altered my opinions as to the libre in the second edition. And had mm -hmm. seen that they did wrong to suspect the emperor had to debate about liberty when they should be defending their country against the foreigners. This alluded to a note which Constant furnished me with. Bertrand told me that the reason why Napoleon discontinued writing his remarks on my book was first, he took up the employment and wrote those things, which all the Oops. world knows. I did not ask him what he really wrote. But Montholon told Kinnaird that he wrote the account of the Battle of Waterloo, which Phillips published. The other reason was that he could not write on my book without exposing the treachery of many men still about the French court, which he did not wish to do. Mm -hmm. I said, Fouché, for instance. Yes, said Bertrand. 
I myself introduced by the back stairs to Napoleon, the courier who had Fouché's dispatches to the enemy eight days before the Battle of Waterloo. Eight days before the Battle of Waterloo. Okay, well, that was an interesting aside. I'm sort of skeptical that that was actually the reason Napoleon stopped writing his response, but... I mean, I guess we don't really know. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have to take every source uh, within its context, and we have to think about why people are saying things, why they're telling certain stories. Um, you know, people want to try to protect their legacy, um, and so that's important to remember when we look at situations like this, <clears throat> and we receive information um, from those who are personally involved in events. On June 10th, 1815, Napoleon and Bertrand, who were consumed with preparing the final concentration of orders for the campaign in Belgium, apprehended an agent of Fouché, carrying dispatches to the enemy. If you enjoyed the video, All right. hit that like button. Well, that was an interesting video. Um, I feel like there was a, a bit of a tangent at the end, to be honest. Um... But I did enjoy <laughs> getting more information on Waterloo, um, more of an explanation than Epic History TV gave. Um, it definitely gave a different perspective. Like I mentioned, um, you know, I'm not really qualified to judge the accuracy of the different perspectives given. Uh, you know, I'm not that familiar with the historiography on the Napoleonic Wars. Um, perhaps some of y'all who are more familiar can can give me sort of a general view of what sort of the accepted views uh, on Waterloo are, or if there's uh, debate among historians um, over what truly went wrong. I, I'm, in fact, I'm sure there is debate. Um, but it was interesting to get more information. I particularly enjoyed uh, early in the video hearing more about the domestic situation in France and considering the role of Louis XVIII, um, and, you know, those in government who were loyal to him uh, and in the army who were loyal to him. Um, in addition, I was, uh, you know, interested to hear about a another rebellion in the Vendée. I'm not sure how wide scale this one was because they sort of mentioned it and then brushed over it. I'm more familiar with the initial uh, counter-revolution in the Vendée, which was a big deal um, <coughs> during the French Revolution. Um but yeah, it was interesting to hear about. So yeah, I enjoyed this one. It was a really interesting one. Um, if you guys enjoyed this one, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out the Patreon, which is linked down below. Um, <coughs> this is, you know, we already finished the Epic History TV series on the Napoleonic Wars. This is sort of capping that off. Yeah, this is an extra video on that. But, of course, I'm going to keep watching Napoleon's Marshals. And if you guys have more suggestions for videos on Napoleon or the French Revolution, then uh, I would be perfectly willing to check them out if they seem interesting. I'm definitely not uh, done with the topic. It's a, uh, a fascinating uh, period of history, and I'm always excited to learn more about it. Um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, I hope all you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again in the next video. Goodbye.